Thank you and welcome to back to the second segment of the show for today. We're talking to Dr. Herbert Marbury from Vanderbilt University and he's given us some information in reference to the institutional church. And he's also given us some excellent information concerning his background and some of the experiences that uh, led him to us this morning. And so Dr. Marbury, let's see if we might be able to pick up where we left off and to have you to start talking about uh, African-Americans and the institutional church from your perspective. Well, I think what's foundational for the, for the institutional church for African-Americans and perhaps foundational for most churches, but particularly for black churches, is the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, you find it uh, in the pulpits. Uh, we preach from it. We, it. It is our authority for, for our moral life. And it is for most Christian communities, the word of God. And I tell my students, uh, every time they step into a pulpit in the midst of a community of believers mm -hmm. and they speak from the Bible, they are speaking for that community. Good. What is the word of God? Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that that um, captured my attention when I was a student at ITC and then later at at at, uh, at Vanderbilt, mm -hmm. uh, had good professors like Professor Victor Anderson mm -hmm. and Professor Lewis Baldwin, mm -hmm. uh, who interests me not only in ethics, that is, that is how black communities think about what's right and wrong, mm -hmm. but also interested me in the history of the black church. Mm -hmm. um, and from that standpoint, I wanted to, st I wanted to know, mm -hmm. well, why, why do black churches, why do churches in general mm -hmm. think of the Bible and use the Bible so differently? Mm -hmm. For example, you, you look in Nashville and you've got churches from one end of the city to mm -hmm. the other. And on fundamental issues, we disagree, and yet the same book is being preached from our pulpits. And I began to, I began to wonder, well, what's going on? It's not the book, the book is the same. Mm -hmm. What's going on the way that we interpret these it's texts? It's the interpretation of Absolutely. the book. Absolutely, exactly. it's the way. And mm -hmm. so I wanted to study how African Americans historically mm -hmm. have interpreted the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's the reason I, Put the, I, I wrote Pillars of Cloud and Fire. Mm -hmm. um, it begins to look at, begins to look at African-American biblical interpretation mm -hmm. from the antebellum period, Good. starting with, starting with slavery. And I look mm -hmm. at, I look at various examples, an example, a radical example and a conservative example mm -hmm. in, in the antebellum period, beginning with um, Absalom Jones Good. and David Walker. Mm -hmm. I move on to look at Reconstruction with um, Francis Ellen Watkins Harper mm -hmm. and John Jasper, mm -hmm. the Harlem Renaissance where, with um, Zora Neale Hurston, mm -hmm. then the era of civil rights with um, Adam Clayton Powell and Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. And finally, I look at the era of black power with Albert Clegg. Mm -hmm. each, each one takes up the book of Exodus, mm -hmm. but takes it up in a very different way. And they take it up based on what I talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. That is, what are the relevant challenges mm -hmm. that my community faces? Mm -hmm. How can I continue to make the Word of God, the Bible, mm -hmm. relevant? And so during, during the uh, antebellum period, Absalom Jones and David Walker both take up the story of Exodus almost literally. Mm -hmm. That if God delivered the children of Israel Good. from Egypt, across yeah. the Red Sea <laughs> into the promised land. Then God. Then God will do the same. <laughs> and the promised land was freedom from slavery. Mm -hmm. Well, freedom from slavery came mm -hmm. and we weren't free. Mm -hmm. uh, we faced Jim Crow and segregation. Mm -hmm. And so if you go to, to the era of reconstruction uh, the, and you look at sermons, the promised land doesn't, doesn't look like freedom from slavery. Emancipation is no longer, mm -hmm. is no, is no longer identified with the promised land. Mm -hmm uplift is. Well, how do, we, how do we educate now? How do we move from just emancipation to education and the kind of cultural attainment that will lift black communities? Mm -hmm. And after, after Reconstruction, that changes again in the Harlem Re Renaissance. This mm -hmm. idea that we need to throw off the manacles of slavery, the old, the old Southern sort of African-American rebirth and a and rebirth. That's, that's right. right. The Renaissance yes. man, mm -hmm. uh, Renaissance man, Renaissance woman. But for the Harlem Renaissance writers, for the most part, mm -hmm. except for Zora Neale Hurston, mm -hmm. they were really thinking rather in, in sexist terms. Mm -hmm. They were thinking the new Negro was mm -hmm. a new Negro man. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Uh, but but Zorno Hurston, I thought, was one of the most interesting figures during that time. Her Moses, Man of the Mountain, um, re helped African-Americans rethink 
the Exodus story mm -hmm. in a way that took the focus off a singular figure like a Moses figure mm -hmm. and put it on the community and mm -hmm. asked us to imagine together what it, would, what it would mean if we all together walked into the promised land mm -hmm. and we weren't waiting for mm -hmm. or dependent upon one singular figure mm -hmm. or God to send one person mm -hmm. to deliver a whole group of people. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I go on to look at the era of civil rights with Adam Clayton Powell and Martin Luther King Jr. who understood the Exodus story and the promised land as being, mm -hmm. as being included as full citizens mm -hmm. that we would certainly enjoy, as Dr. Martin Luther King would say, mm -hmm. the blessings of liberty. And, and if you look at his speeches, he takes the rhetoric from the Constitution and the Declaration mm -hmm. of Independence, the kind of rhetoric that, that founded our nation, mm -hmm. and he connects it to the Exodus story. And freedom means becoming a full citizen. Mm -hmm. um, well, after, at, at a certain point, after, after the, by the end of the Civil Rights mm -hmm. Movement, we find that, Adam, that um, Albert Clegg mm -hmm. wants to do something very different with that, mm -hmm. that there's the frustration uh, that has risen because African Americans still aren't enjoying the blessings of liberty. Mm -hmm. There is a move to take that story and to claim it for ourselves and to claim the power to change mm -hmm. our lives. Uh, not that power, uh, but, but not placing it in the founding documents, but placing it in black communities themselves. And so we get the black power movement. So I wanted to look at the various ways that we have interpreted one singular book, the book mm -hmm. of Exodus, mm -hmm. over the course of a long period of time. But my, my, my concern was to show that each interpreter started first with the concerns of their community at that time. And I, and I wanted to encourage uh, my students who were, who were going to serve churches and serve in religious communities to do the same. You know, <clears throat> during this uh, second segment, I mean, the final segment, mm -hmm. what I would like for you to do is to, uh, and I think you've mentioned uh, Adam Clayton Powell and mm -hmm. Dr. Martin Luther King. I, yeah. I think that these are two giants, yeah. but I think that people know more about uh, Dr. King mm -hmm. than they do about Adam Clayton Powell. Mm -hmm. And so during this, second, uh, this final segment, when we come back, we've got about uh, 45 or 50 uh, seconds here. But when we come back during this uh, final segment, what I'd like for you to do, and I say this now because I don't want to forget uh, right. to, to push it forward. I want you to talk about Dr. Martin Luther King and Adam Clayton Powell and with emphasis up on Adam Clayton Powell and why he sh is significant and what the things that you've been doing. All OK. Right. And so what we'll do, we'll take this uh, final uh, final commercial break and then we'll come back and we'll deal with uh, some right. aspects of Dr. Uh, Martin Luther King and Adam Clayton Powell and we'll be back with our audience following this very very short commercial break. You look like you've been doing this all your life I man. I got it. Uh, no, this is my first yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh man, you yeah, you're good. Cause you got the information. That's what makes yeah. you good. See, when you have the information, then uh, mm -hmm. you can do it. Yeah. See, you. and so when we come back to in this uh, final segment, I'll introduce the uh, show again. Oh. But uh, and, and in case I forget, but what I'd like for you to do is to look at these two personalities oh. in the context of all the things that you've studied about them and writing your book. Uh, and, and books and et cetera, and to look and, and to examine those two individuals, Dr. Martin Luther King and Adam Clayton Powell, and point out whatever the similarities or difficulties and et cetera, whatever you want to talk about. But I, I, I think that that would be good to end this because these are the two most important individuals yeah. <clears throat> in terms of contemporary black uh, society and uh, the uh, uh, institutional church. You see, and I'd like to know more about the, you know about this myself. You see. And so when we come back, we'll do that. Right. We'll, be, uh, we'll do this. We'll have, <coughs> excuse me, we'll have 10 minutes to do this. I need some water myself. Yeah. <coughs> okay, very good. Thank you, now. Herbert Marbury. Yes, that's okay. it. Okay, well, you know, I have to do that every time. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> You're giving us some excellent, and I don't make too. I don't want to make any noise. I mean.
Thank you and welcome back to the final segment of the show for today.